What is up, players? It's your Slayer, Major Broski, coming at you with another episode of Legends Lounge with co host Dead Broke Nerd and special guest Flo Mega talking about all of the new cars today. So awesome. Dead Broke Nerd, going ahead and talk about what Legends Lounge is all about. Yeah, so what we're doing here at Legends Lounge is attempting to have a show that encompasses everything Elder Scrolls Legends, from new card previews to discussing nerfs, discussing top-level events, and also teaching new players some of the intricacies of the game. So basically, it's a show for everybody, and we hope to incorporate um, information and useful tips um, that people can find, you know, applicable at all levels. So... That's pretty much it, and uh, today we have an awesome special guest. Who's hyped about that? I'm pretty hyped about hey, it. Hey, guys. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so uh, I just want to say, um, not you know, this is on my channel, so of course I'm uh, hosting it with through uh, you know my uh, my streaming service, uh, SLOBS, and uh, things are weird. I'm not arrogant. I'm not trying to be bigger than everybody else. It just <laughs> happened, so forgive me. <laughs> Uh, for those may who may be listening to the podcast later, the uh, the videos are, uh, the cards, uh, they're about the same, but the videos within the cards are like really small, and so I'm over here being mm. just the huge monster Major Broski over here. He's and, actually uh, changing his in-game name to Lord Broski. He Lord. reigns. <laughs> uh, so stay tuned for that update. Okay. Um, we do have Flow Mega. He is a neutral card. I know people have been complaining, say that we should nerf him down to a yellow, but uh, instead we're just gonna go on ahead, and uh, the nerf is just gonna be increasing his cost up to one more. <laughs> I think that will actually fix out Flow Mega as a six drop. So just stay tuned for that. Popular Sorry. nerf in Legends. <laughs> Increase by one Magicka, and be surprised when things don't change. <laughs> yeah. Oh god. Uh, so what's on the uh what's on the agenda, Broski? Uh this is going ahead. I just a couple things on the news here. Uh Madness deals have ended. Um last yesterday's deal, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but we got some gems, a couple of legendary packs, a unique title, and uh and that's it, I think. Uh and and they also quoted and much more. I don't know what that much more was because I didn't buy it. I'm I'm they're I'll actually I, huh? I was interested by that. There, there wasn't a, a much more. It was just more details about it. So they said 30 packs, or however many packs, I think it was 30. And then they said, and, and much more. And then you go in, it's like, here's all the different breakdowns of the packs. Basically, they couldn't fit the description on the little thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I was I was intrigued by the and much more, and I was let down. Yeah. Well, I, thought it was a, I thought it was a decent deal. I think it was like, I don't know if it was 30. It might have been 20 or it was 20. 15 to 20. I don't know. 20. Okay. Um, I, I know this because the holidays have taken my bank account, so I'm looking at them like, it's not that bad of a deal. Too bad I can't get it. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, go ahead. You got the, the one legendary that came with it, and then um, they promised a premium, but for people who bought it fairly early, it didn't come with a premium. It was just two regular legendaries, so they let you keep that legendary and then gifted you another premium. Oh, so, nice. Yeah, if you hopped on it early, it was actually pretty decent. Nice. Well, most of the time, the deals were were pretty good in terms of like financially. Um, you know, we just had to deal with the uh, frustration of people who wanted to collect the card backs. But besides that, I feel like the madness thing was overall a success. Could, could would you would would you would say agree. the same? I would agree with I that. Think... I do have a, a Twitter post that I did a few days ago. I don't know if uh, you saw it, nerd. Um, I think flows on follows me on. I don't know for certain, but I talked about I talked about the card backs, and I said I said it was pretty much a good deal. I said that uh, right now the legends, you know, the people who are working up at those since Mark Events, they may be working for a deal on the card backs in the future. But if you look at the math in general, you're getting a hell of a deal on the cards that were available just in of itself. You get yeah. like I think it was like twenty percent off on the cards, and so pretty much you're getting the card back for free, you know, in that uh, regard and. People are like super upset. They're like, well, what about the players who've been around for a while? And I'm like, I mean, they're not just looking at you. I mean, just think about it. These Madness deals probably bringing a huge, and I don't know about you guys, but I've been seeing huge advertisement that I never saw with Legends before, just scrolling through Facebook or Twitter or stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I think they're getting some new players coming in, especially with these deals. And so I can't, I don't know. I'm not upset with them. I mean, I do. I think it was pricey, yeah, but I also didn't buy it. 
but I didn't think it was a bad deal. Yeah. I remember CBH saying something recently about um, thousands of new players a day, which I don't know if that's true. I hope it's true. And I can kind of feel uh, more hype around Reddit. You were saying ads on Facebook, and I guarantee uh, they got loaded with cash from this uh, Festival of Madness. I, I really, I, I mean, I'm hoping that gets fueled back into like, you know, the marketing in general. I mean, if that's if that's kind of something that supports that, then great. Honestly, the thing is, like, I think the just to be clear, like, none of the deals, even like the the ones with the card backs, are bad. It's just, I mean, I don't even have all the cards still, like, but I'm not. I don't need packs, not really. You know, I, I'm at the point where I've got like a couple thousand dust, and I can just sort of play my my, you know, my quest. I'm really bad about doing my quest, but I can just sort of play my quests and you know knock out the win three wins get enough gold and then just sort of slowly build my collection from there i mean you get a random card every time you get three wins like i, I don't need packs but i would like card backs you know what i mean mm -hmm, so i think yeah. that's there's a lot of players who just they have all the cards they have so many cards they have so much stuff they don't need packs packs are a bad investment for them so sort of locking out the ability to go and grab those card backs for the players you know who maybe are very committed to the game but maybe aren't in the financial situation to drop 50 bucks just for a card back because the packs are superfluous. I think that's where the, this like, I, that's I, where people were upset. I think, I, I think that suck it up. maybe yeah, <laughs> those people are in the minority. This should be, I mean, CVA said this yeah, day no, on Twitter. Is, they're yeah. in a huge minority and who knows, you know, they might have like a pre-order deal where you get both of the card backs for $50 and like a huge set for the man is like a hundred cars or something from the madness set that's coming out or you know i mean you don't know so um there might be a set coming up in the future and this is their way of doing it so we'll, we'll see I, I don't know yeah costa costa pointed out in chat that if flow was a blue card uh we'd be giving people telvani ptsd right now <laughs> so <clears throat> bear that in mind i was a yellow card though <laughs> right into the uh the wolf synergy that's my only stipulation. It's got to be. It's got to be. Something <laughs> oh yeah, man. Uh, good old animal. I I actually uh, had a lot of fun playing animal uh, monk for a while, and uh, it's not very good. And it, and honestly, like, I feel like it's not even less viable when uh, that that set came out. Um, what is it called? I already forgot the the spark frost frosty pants. Whatever. Frost spark. Yeah. 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 Frost spark. <laughs> uh so someday someday animal theme will be viable someday when when i was climbing the ladder the other day on stream i said why the heck is this dude like rank 120 and playing monk and everybody in the chat got on to me they're like what's wrong with monk blah 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 blah, blah. and i'm like <laughs> i literally watched <laughs> i watched nerd for a month play monk and he said it was terrible and then logic goes at me he goes he goes, I'm going to go ahead and tell dead bro nerd. And I'm like, I literally just <laughs> said he failed for an entire month with uh, with Monk, man. You can't do this to me. I made it to legend. I oh, what? It. Like, legend 2000? I mean. <laughs> yeah, man, the first two weeks I was insisting on, like, uh, bringing back Alter Monk <laughs> oh, and God. making uh, Chanter Monk work. <laughs> Neither of <laughs> which works. <laughs> those, are, those are tall tasks. <laughs> It's just every time I would I would try to make a, like Chanter Nick Socks uh, a thing, mm -hmm. uh, but then I'd run against uh, Nick Socks uh, <laughs> and Avani and just cry. I'm like, why can you oh, do yeah. it so much better? <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, okay. I, like, I don't know. I, it's Monk. Monk is just. Uh, I don't think it's bad. I actually think Mid Monk has some really solid matchups against some meta decks. But against the field, and when you don't know what you're going into, that's where it becomes a problem. Yeah, mid monk can be like a, actually a pretty good glass cannon. If you, I mean, if you combo off on some sort of dawnbreaker, swift strike, or some sort of mm -hmm. buff and a swift strike, plus uh, monk just has a lot of really good prophecies. So if you see a bunch of aggro running around, running a monk with fourteen <laughs> or fifteen prophecies, a bunch of healing, and like fifteen yeah. burst, and it's not bad. Well, and, and like put it in race scenarios against like an aggro deck. You're right with all the prophecies, and then being able to monk strike something over and heal up while still going face. And then, I mean, obviously, like swift strike is so damn good. Like I started even running a copy or two in my Dagoth decks just because like the surprise. Like it's hard. It's hard to play around 
it's hard to yeah. play around Swift Strike. Um, <laughs> when when uh, the Sword of the Inferno was printed, um, Rocket Boy made a Swift Strike Archer that won like 25 games in a row, and he was like, "Is this broken? Like, does this need to be nerfed?" <laughs> and then that's when we all started putting Swift Strike in Dagoth, and we're like, "This card's nuts! You can burst for like 15 with three. Yeah, it's let me just, just uh, slap this Sentinel Battle Mace down. Yeah, and I don't even get me started with Battle yeah. Mace, dude. Well, you don't like Battle Mace? Oh, gosh, I hate playing against Battle Mace. <laughs> there's two cards that... There's one card that I think that needs... And I, and I brought this up the last episode. One card I think that needs to be buffed is... Um, Warnhold Trader. Everybody disagrees you with me on it. that. And I'm on the Nerd. fence about Battle Mace. Because I'm like, four for plus four <laughs> in Ward? I just... What? Like, I just... Defense. It doesn't give defense. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it doesn't I give doubt. defense, but it doesn't matter. You got ward, like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I, I mean, dude. yeah, you are the pretty much the only person who who dis, who thinks that about Mornhold Trader. Is the card really good? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm the only person on the planet. So yeah, I think you know. it's just because, like, when you get like Mornhold Traded on turn one with the Ring of Magicka a few times, then it starts really feeling shitty. Um. Uh, but on turn two, it's not actually that bad, especially with like the, all the lethal uh, two drops out there. I mean, I play it. I play it a lot, you know, my Halalu <laughs> deck myself. But that doesn't mean I hate it any less. I mean, if the card's good, you play it. I mean, that's just bottom line. <laughs> no, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> no, no doubt. <laughs> <Yep. laughs> all right. So moving on. Um, warp meta. Uh, Dead Burnt Nerd, go ahead. Tell us all about warp meta. Oh man, I had so much fun. We had like the best. The, yeah, the he was. You were casting it, right? Yeah, I was casting with Charlie. Right. It was tons of fun. Mm. Uh, we had a million technical difficulties. Uh, <laughs> this warp meta was actually brought to you uh, by Costa's girlfriend tripping over the router cord. Um, <laughs> so, uh, good job, Costa. I know you're in chat. <laughs> uh, but no, we had a ton of fun. Um, Actually, a lot of different um, a lot of different classes were featured. I think like well over seventy five percent of the classes, total classes in the game, were featured on the on the stream. So that was really cool. Picked the right games, I guess. Um, and then there was a really fun uh, final match between Horiyoshi Fufu, uh, who beat Endo two uh, one in the finals. So Endo unfortunately uh, got second for about the seventeenth billion time. Um, I'm just still a great player. I mean to get <laughs> oh, just no, to yeah. get seven, second place for the seventeenth billionth time, dude. I yeah. I don't usually don't even think there were that many warp metas. That's pretty awesome. Did you did you catch that <laughs> one? Uh, did, did you catch that finals uh, nah, game? I didn't. I didn't watch it yesterday. My it, brother's in I, town I, right now, so I've been spending time with him. I don't want to like take anything away from Fufu because Fufu played great. Really, and mm -hmm. and took down Abomination Scout in uh, the first game. So. Yay, good job. You're my hero. Um, but, like, <laughs> the last game was tied 1-1. Um, and it was playing, like, typical aggro warrior with Siege Catapult. Filled up a lane, had a huge powerful lane with Siege Catapult. And it just so happened that um, that Fufu had not one, but two green packed ambushers in hand to go oh, boom, boom, gosh. right after and to set up this really powerful, like, unanswerable board in the shadow lane. And it was just like... Damn, <laughs> feels bad, man. Yeah. That's rough. <laughs> so, I mean, that was pretty much the defining thing of of that match. So, uh, but anyways, a lot of fun. Um, that sucks, dude. I've never actually had that happen, man. And I run Green Pact Ambusher in a lot of my decks. I think that card's really good. A lot of people are like, "No, nah, it's not that good," but it won yesterday. So, hey. Um. All that's right. insane, and that's a great deck for that card to counter too. The catapult warrior, because I mean, okay. warrior loves stacking lanes, and, yeah, and that's, it, that's it was just devastating. Yeah, I mean, it just devastated the game. Like it was over from that point on. Um, and and like without those green pack ambushers, I would have been like, I would have given you know eighty twenty odds to 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 Endo, based right. on like board state and and even the the content of their hands, like. Looking at, without the green pecked ambushers, even just even one of the ambushers wouldn't have been so bad, but two of them was just like wow, just devastating. But um, 
supposedly we're not sure if Warp Meta is having another event this weekend, guys. So stay tuned for that. Just keep an eye on the Warp Meta Discord and Twitter um, to see if they're going to have an event. Apparently there's some technical stuff or maybe they're working on something in the background they don't want to tell us yet. I think that's what it is. But anyways, um, hopefully they do because I was actually thinking I'd play in it this week if they, uh, if they did. Uh, but as soon as I decide I have time to play in an event, <laughs> they, they get canceled. <laughs> um, <clears throat> just uh, as an update to Warp Meta, I mean, I don't, I don't ever participate in it um, simply due to time restraints. But what I do know, and this is what today's episode is going to be about, we're going to be talking about the new cards. Um, Cheese Mancer and the cards dealing with Isles of Madness weren't allowed in Warp Meta because you cannot purchase it with gems currently. It was only through the two deals um mm -hmm. recently so just an fyi um and we had somebody uh, i think aquaman didn't get the memo and was playing uh the uh, madness beckons card <laughs> so that just threw a whole nother wrench in the uh in the plans there oh gosh but, uh, i've seen people messing with that and like unite uh tribunal it seems mm -hmm. fun i try to i don't <clears throat> We'll, we'll talk about it when we get there. So let's go ahead and talk about the new card so I can go ahead and talk about what I want to talk about. Because it's okay. all about me, right? <laughs> Alright. Uh, new cards. We have Madness Beckons. Alright. And uh, I'm not going to put the cards on screen today because we have all three of us on screen. So I'm just going to read it off for this episode. Um, it's a one-drop action card. And it reads, put a random Isles of Madness card into your hand. There's an entire list. We will go through that list. Um, but just on the forthright thoughts on this, this is what I wanted to say. I am not, and I've seen it competitively. This is just a personal preference. This is a preference thing. The card is good. I see where it's good, but as a personal preference, I think I don't like giving my opponent cards and I don't that therefore I don't like Mudcrab Merchant is that's just a personal preference, right? The card's good. I'm not, you know, trying to say that you shouldn't put it in your deck. It's just personal preference. So when this card was introduced, I kind of liked it because I'm like, Hey, it's kind of an alternative, just at the forefront. Um, but you only get limitation of eight cards, while Bug Cry Merchant's pretty much the entire library ever. So, um, I don't know. What are you guys' thoughts just on that alone, before we get uh, diving into the uh, the rest of the cards? Uh, I think it's it's an interesting card. I think it's a bit different from Mud Crab. Um, I think Mud Crab's awesome as a token. So, like, if you're playing something aggressive and you want to hit the board on turn one, but you don't want to lose tempo, it's nice to play a one-two and also have a chance to draw something decent. Now, sometimes the crab can screw you over. That sucks. But uh, more often than not, it's that one-two body that eventually becomes, like, a three-four if you hit it with a, a scimitar or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. The card, like, as a promotion, though, I thought was brilliant. I think it's a great way to spoil things. I think it's the perfect power level. It's not, like... It's not a card that everyone at the top of the ladder is going to be like, oh, you better play Madden's Beckons, you're just going to lose. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a great way to get the cards out there without, like, you know, slowly leaking releases in a general way. I thought it was a really creative way to spin things. Um, I do want to add on here. I, I kind of hope here soon that they will make it where you can purchase it with gems because, or at least pay it with cash, something where you can get it because I kind of feel a little bit cheap for even though these cards like cheese mancer and this card aren't, aren't like the greatest cards mm -hmm. ever ever i kind of feel cheap climbing the ladder with it i because just other people don't have it and there's no way that they can get it um because the time's past you know it's so what if a new player comes onto the ladder you know like tomorrow and i mean you won't be able to get it until they you know do release it so but i mean it's not like it's an overpowered card it's not like i'm gonna drop it then like insta win you know it's just there's a card that somebody else just cannot have like they you can't purchase it with in-game currency or you know IRL currency, it's just kind of, oh, I got it, and you don't. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Good point. Um, nerd, you want to add something onto this card? No, oh, yeah, I mean, like, you guys hit it on the nail. I think the the best thing about the cards with Flow Set, which is that it's an awesome way to promote the new set and like spoil some cards and it kind of had the you know for a, maybe an hour because you know. When you put Reddit to something, then they'll get it solved quickly. But like for like an hour, it's like, oh my gosh, what kind of cards can be found in this? Like it was a cool little treasure hunt, you know? I, I thought that was awesome. I was really excited by that. And I actually like honestly, I, I don't get on I don't check Reddit usually until the evening. So like I woke up, 
set up my stream, got in there. I was like, huh, I wonder what this, uh, what the Days Madness deal is. I opened it up. What? What is this? Let's play around with this. Like, that was awesome. I, I really like that. As for, like, if it's good or not, uh, the interesting thing about it is that you have, um, there's only six cards you can pull with it right now. Now, what I'm interested in is, will that increase once Isles comes out for real? Like, will playing uh, Madness Beckons give us access to the whole 50 or so cards that are in the set once the whole set's un unlocked? Or will it, for now, like, for now, you can only get the six cards because that's all Beth uh, Bethesda and Sparky fans want to spoil. Will that open up? That's kind of what I am interested by. But ultimately, yeah, really fun. Probably not good, except for Unite Decks. And in fact, actually, um, what is nice about it is that right now, the, all, all the six of the cards are creatures. So you know you're going to get a creature from it, which is kind of useful. And none of the creatures that you can get from it are bad, per se, especially in, like, the mid to late game. So, except for maybe Giant Chicken, arguably. But if you have seven magic to spend, it's still a 5-5 five -five that, you know, refills the lane. I don't know. Nothing's outright terrible um, with a, you know, one in six chance of getting Icy Shambles, which is dope. Like, I don't know. It, it, it doesn't seem garbage if it stays at these six cards, you know, down the road. All right, so I'm going to go on ahead and uh, drop a link to that image in the chat. Um, only because we don't, just for today's episode, because we're having our special guest, Flo Mega, ruining it for us. I mean, our special guest, Flo Mega. Um, <laughs> we can't just, you know, have these things. Otherwise, we would have to hide one of our beautiful faces, and we wouldn't want to do that to the audience, of course. Mm -hmm. I so, volunteer as tribute. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, especially, okay, so... The uh, let's go on ahead and go through the uh, the seven cards that you do get the creatures from Mad Madness Beckons, right? It's a one drop. Now I do want to say this: you put you do put one of these cards in your hand. So uh, even after you summon this, you don't instantaneously get something else like right on top of the board. It is something that you have to summon, then you get something else right uh, into your hand. So starting with the first card on the list, um, we're gonna go on ahead. I'll copy and paste that into the chat. We're gonna be reading the top row, then the bottom row. Starting with the first one. Fortress Guard is a 3-4 with the card description that reads, Summon, you may discard a card to become a 2-2 two, two, um, Polivian Trooper with Guard in the other lane. What are y'all's two thoughts on this card? So, we talked a lot about this card in um, the podcast End of Time last week, the episode we did. It's, 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 a, it's in a weird space because, like, the the colors that are able to discard cards, the colors that have cards that they don't really need, are usually green, right? You have like Cern Pawnbroker, Completed Contracts, maybe blue if you're discarding things like daggers or an occasional tome from a daggerfall. But those aren't really great token decks. Like this card is an insane token generator. You discard a card and get is it five six for four and two bodies and two mm -hmm. guards. Yeah, if you have like Divine Fervor or an Orc Clan Captain or a Fifth Legion Trainer or you follow that up with like a Resolute Ally and buff your whole lane, that's insane. Um, the problem though is you're not going to be able to find a really strong token deck. I mean, you can go for something like Token Monk or Token Mage if those make a comeback uh, without discarding something that you actually want to be playing on the board. And especially token decks, they just flood everything. They just play everything they possibly can. So discarding a card a lot of times can be really rough. I think... Uh, the value of this card overall will depend on other cards released in the set. So, like, if those archetypes got other buffs, Token Monk, Token Mage, if they found other ways to produce value, I think this card could be nuts in those sorts of decks. Yeah. Um, one of the cool things is that with Marked Man, you know, dishing the makeshift defenses is basically upgrades the makeshift defenses to something with an attack stat. Um, That's true. But... I mean, ultimately, you're right. Like, you need card generation or insane amounts of card draw for this to be super effective. Um, and it's kind of, you know, interestingly, like um, Jelly said, and I, I put together an article of, of community um, sort of hot takes on these cards. Actually, let me link that. Uh, I have it up here. Uh, but Jelly just sort of said it probably the best in my opinion which is that um discarding the discard mechanic is just sort of hard to evaluate um 
because it relies so heavily on on what the average strength of the cards in your hand is. So like mm -hmm. if you are effectively considering the card you discard being two two stats, sometimes like ideally your cards are worth more than that. So it really does, like you said, re like rely on things like you know pawnbroker or um, you know crown quartermaster and, and then marked man. Um, but you know I don't know if there are si certain situations in which um, a two two with guard is going to be better than the Nord firebrand you pulled off of uh, a pawnbroker. But certain situations where that firebrand is going to be more useful. So I don't know. It's interesting. I just would need to see more of the set to sort of evaluate. Yeah, I'd like to add to one sort of crazy thing about this card is in Hualu, you were talking about Unite the Houses earlier. Um, in Hualu, mm -hmm. this gives Hualu purple. So mm -hmm. if Hualu has a Haunted Manor up, that's three colors, and then they play this card, there's purple. You only need blue now, and that's all five, which is, I mean, that, that's two cards with four colors. Yeah, that's, pretty, that's pretty a good, good. point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for only, uh, I mean, I don't, I guess you probably want to play the manor down first, but I mean, Fortress Guard's only four Magicka, and then you have Unite the Houses for three, so as long as you can snag a blue guy off of something, yeah, that's a good point. And in that deck especially, like, your hand is like, what, 30% garbage? Because you're trying to find your <laughs> yeah. couple pieces, so, yeah. and it's two guards, so. That's a good point. Yeah. No, I, uh, I think, um, I mean, uh, JT Harp, by the way, is it JT Harp or J Tharp? J Tharp. It's J Tharp. Mm -hmm. All right. I've heard like five people he, say it differently. He, to he told I just me when, uh, stop. he was, I just uh, avoid it altogether and call him. <laughs> His name's Josh. Um, yeah. no, it, it, whenever I was, uh, casting the, war, uh, not war meta, whenever I was casting for Blood Warriors Guild, he, yeah. uh, he told me cause, uh, he won a, uh, series. And it's Jay Thart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He. Uh, yeah. He mentioned that as well. But uh, I. I was. I don't play much United the Houses, so it's neat because uh, I kind of forgotten that supports count for that. So. He was the one who mentioned it to me too. I didn't come yeah. up with that myself. Jo Josh told me that. So. Yeah. It's it's pretty cool though. I think this is a card that is like a neat, and, and like I talk about this a lot here, and and Broski's probably sick of hearing these two words but i think it's elegant design mm -hmm. it's just something that like is it has <clears throat> layers to it you don't have to discard the card but you know and it's not an overwhelmingly amazing effect like arguably corner club is so good be that like you have to discard the card oh well you do have to discard the card but like you know like it's so good like why would you not like drawing the two cards Corner Club's amazing. This card, there are plenty of times where, like, you just don't need the trooper, but then there are other times where it'll be amazing, and that sort of layered process of whether or not this card is good or in, in situational utility, I just think that that's a really cool design element in general. Yeah, I agree. There were a lot of cards um, released in this sort of six uh, mm -hmm. mini-release that I thought were really elegant design. We can talk about a few of them. In the future and how they were elegant yeah i don't really have anything myself to move on to fortress guard um i i have, I have more opinions uh for some of the other cards but fortress guard i mean i don't it's a three four with guard um uh yay another guard for yellow i <laughs> I, I don't know uh we have some or we already have some pretty decent guards in, in the yellow set um so i don't I don't, I don't really have a, you know, a huge opinion for it, and you're able to uh, discard a card for another guard. Um, you know, I don't know. I could, I could see the effectiveness of it. It's like Nerd already said, it's elegant. I don't really have anything to add on to what you guys have already said. So we can move on to the next card. Uh, <laughs> okay. Grumite Magus? Is that how you say it? I don't know. Magus. Magus. So. Grumite Magus. It's, it's off the root of it's, Mage. It's yeah. a okay. seven drop five five with guard. And when I you play D and D, so and when you summon, <laughs> your opponent discards the highest cost action in their hand. I do have an opinion for this this card at least. Um, two things. I do not like in in hand removal. Um, 
I just don't. Just bottom line. Uh, nerd will agree with me on this one. Death Priest Hollow needs to be buried. Um, da down, down, like, not just eight feet deep, like, into hell. That card. Yeah, <laughs> that, I, just, in-hand removal, I think it's cheap. Um, luckily, uh, Grumite is expensive. It costs seven, and it's a guard, so it's easy to remove him on the board. But the issue is, as soon as you summon, his effect is in play. Now, I don't want to always get stuck playing, talking about Toy's Conscription, but I feel like because it's such a powerful card, it is worth mentioning. It is been, the cost for Toy's Conscription has been increased from an 11 to a 12. So we haven't seen the entire Madness Collection set yet. So this is just food for thought looking at um, Grumite right here. It, it You remove the highest cost creature i mean that, that, excuse me the highest cost action card from your opponent's hand the fact that conscription is now a 12 cost means that he costs more than ele other 11 cost car action cards or 10 or whatever like it really is like like it's a really high action card so maybe this is a way to respond to conscription question mark the thing the reason why i'm so hesitant is because it's so expensive it's a seven cost right and number two, it's in red. So unless you're playing a ramp warrior deck, I don't really see how it's going to have a lot of use. Like, why would you, this is not a card that I would see myself using in Halalu. Okay, aggro Halalu. Maybe Halalu will somehow figure out a way out of aggro. I don't know. But as of right now, where it stands, just looking at the card, um, uh battle mage Ew. i i don't know i like I'm, i look at it, i'm like what what cards work with red and um dagoth would be one of them you know maybe i don't know but why would i pick this card over the cards that i already have in dagoth i wouldn't i don't know um <laughs> uh, just ramp warrior is about all i got and even then i'm kind of is it worth it is it really worth it, you know, at that point? Because I'm doing Ramp Warrior, I'm already trying to outpace somebody who's Televani Conscription. So, it's... So... Uh, what are y'all's thoughts? So, I had, like, multiple thoughts flying through my brain. Uh, you must be my muse, Broski. Um, <laughs> so, the first thing uh, is that, like, I had this idea. What if there was, like, a 15 Magicka action card right that could only be accessed vis-a-vis -vis ramping or gaining temporary magic out of green i just think that would be really cool like really powerful but like you know you can't access it you know with 12 magic i just think that'd be neat that's all um <laughs> but, uh, it'd be interesting it'd be interesting if it were in like a dual class that doesn't have purple so like literally yeah. the only way you can get there is like cheating it somehow with contracts or torpor yeah. or something like that I think a bit, yeah, like out of uh, like out of green or something. Like like yeah. leave purple out of it, you know. <laughs> That's cool. I like yeah. That. Um, no, I think the 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 Grumite Magus, um, like the thing is, one uh, with Halalu. You're talking about Halalu. Um, we did see a uh, sort of controly greedy late game Halalu build in Warp Meta by. Uh, I think Thule Deer had one. Oh, that's and a thing. Like it exists. <laughs> I don't. Oh, I, yeah. I, oh yeah. Um, yeah. I need. I need took that deck that you're talking about. This control Hualu Rage Conscription deck to the top mm -hmm. of the ladder. Uh, five or six months ago, maybe. And yeah. the deck, the deck's awesome for late in the season when everyone's playing Warrior Hualu Crusader, <laughs> all the aggressive decks to rank up. That deck mm -hmm. squashes aggro decks. It's so yeah. good against aggro decks. Um, but yeah, he beat me with it. I only did that Wally deck. I should have banned it 100%. Was that, was that uh, uh, this last one? This yeah. Last one yeah. yeah. Two okay, okay, so maybe it was I need then. I, I thought there's Full Deer, but it might have been I need. But Full uh, Deer might have too. Yeah, it, it's it's pretty good. I don't know if Grimmite Magus fits into it, but that's the one thing. I have a couple little things to say about Magus, and one is I think. Broski, you're right. I think it's gonna have a hard time finding a place in something, so I'm not really scared of it yet. Uh, two, I I think that um, it's it's for more than just blowing up um, conscription. It also blows up rage. So rage and conscription yeah. are two like like 
deck definers, right? So like mm -hmm. you, if you're including rage, you're building the deck around using rage. Um, and that's always going to be in a rage deck. That's almost always going to be the highest cost action. Um, and then also journey decks. Um, so now with journey and conscription, you, you know, usually that sometimes they're paired together, but you look at like, um, a bomb and, you know, the journey is always going to be the highest cost cost action. So you can kill that journey and all of a sudden abomination scout is looking pretty rough. Um, so that's why it's printed. I, I think, I think it's, decks. It's. It, I, I mean, I hate. Not great. As I said, I hate in hand removal, and I don't yeah. think I. A lot of the issues of the cards that we do have right now on the ladder are action cards. I mean, toys like you just brought them yeah. up. You know, unstoppable rays, toys conscription. Like these two cards. Like these are two cards where I think we're like, man, I'm about to win the game, and then all of a sudden you have, hey, conscription or. Uh, or you know, unstoppable rage with drain. Oh God, you know whatever. So this is this is a way of responding, you know, to those things. So you're right in saying that, but I'm just gonna well, say it for the third time, where 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 is it gonna be played? And that's right. yeah. No, I I totally agree, and and hopefully uh, Flo can bring some some light to that. But the one thing I wanted to say was just to agree. I despise hand and deck destruction as on a principle. And I think this is something that, like, you're like the devs are pulling from, like, magic. And that's cool, except that magic has counter spells. Okay? Tesla does not have a way to counter this. So the only counter to something like Death Priest is not drawing your expensive creatures, which you have zero control over. Uh, and it's the same thing yeah. here. What? Am I just going to never play my actions and hope I never draw them? You, you, you can't, there's no way to look at your opponent's hand, so you can't check your opponent's hand for something. There's no way to, to negate or, or like, counterspell uh, a summon effect. You just can't do it. There's not even a card that turns off. I think if there was a card, like, a creature, maybe, like, similar to Withered Hand Cultist, that mm -hmm. while it's on the board... Dude, I was just effects, thinking this. I was just thinking this. Off, I think that'd be kind of cool. Oh, wow, uh, dude. But, um, yeah, that, that's the only thing. That's why I hate hand and deck mm -hmm. destruction. There's no way around it. It punishes you for wanting to play the game. Like, it's just, a, it, it's not that it's broken. It's just that it's a negative play experience that I think turns people off. That's all. Yeah. Uh, I 100% agree on discarding cards from your opponent's hand. I don't think it's, it, it's probably the most feels bad moment in the game. And you're like, oh, I have this plan, this plan, this plan. And your opponent just either turns something into a mummy, plays Gentleman Jim, and you got to give something up, or this card, this card's an action. Um, At least with Gentleman, say, though, you get to pick a card. I mean, to be fair. Yeah. 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 Um, this card, to me, and the meta that we have right now, seems like it was printed mostly as a check on Abomination. Uh, that has just gotten better like they since they nerfed drain vitality which made the deck worse um there have been a lot of cards printed that really help abomination scout and the more cards that are printed if anything is cheap and draws cars which isn't really much of a criteria for a card it's going to give abomination a buff this card just directly counters abomination if you just wait until the end and they have journey which they draw their entire deck by turn eight so there's three cards left in their deck and ten in their hand one's probably journey you win the game if you discard their journey. That said, the card's just not good, like, in any other situation. Um, because where are you going to put it? And you guys were talking about it. Like, if it's an aggro, so you have a 7-cost 5-5 five, five with guard. The guard's not good because you're not playing it to defend against anything. You're playing it to not die, which you can't hide it now because it has guard. And if you're playing it in a control deck, it's the same problem. You just spent seven on a five-five with guard. Now sometimes you'll discard a rage, sometimes you'll discard a conscription. Um, but I just think the stats are so bad, and once people play with it and realize that it's just not worth one the tempo loss, even if you do get to discard a card, and like <laughs> the super tempo loss if you miss, uh, it's just too much of a risk. I think to see like regular play and be as much of an annoyance as it could be. So so now. If this card was purple or blue, would that change your opinion on it? Blue. Uh, I I think I think blue would change it for me because blue already plays in uh, other controlly kind of decks. I mean, as far as uh, purple, I don't I don't know. Like because I, I just more... I'm trying to think like the hmm. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. I, I just I, I just I just think purple's like the when I think of purple, I think of. And this isn't just, of course, it's in Tele, uh, Televani, but 
I mean, I also think of like things like you know Warrior. I also think of things because we already just talked about how it would have been in like an aggro deck and Warrior plays that. Uh, like I said, Ramp Warrior would make sense. So you know, it'd still fit in that category, and that's the only one that I could think of. But even that's questionable. You could talk about like Mid Sork, but even then, I'm kind of like okay. Um, so um, I have been seeing a regurgence of Spell Sword. So maybe in that sense, but I, I think I think if it was blue because of the nature of blue in of itself i'd be like okay this will definitely see a little bit more play because blue's willing to I, I wouldn't say it would be a card that would just be instantaneously like this is a card that i need to have in my deck but if it works well with you know already controlling it's a consideration maybe and right now i don't it's, think it is it's a, a tech choice right so i mean if it were in purple um, I think it would see play if the meta were incredibly greedy, like just incredibly, incredibly greedy journeys and conscriptions and rages everywhere, which, I mean, depending on what they print, who knows? Um, also in purple as a five, five, it's kind of hard, but if you're dealing a necromancer, you could bring it back. And plus purple has good creatures with uprising, which could be annoying. Uh, I think the card could be problematic in purple. I'm glad it's not. And I just don't think it's very strong in red, to be honest. No. Agreed. Um, just a note here what Logic said, and then we'll move on to the next card. Um, Logic said, it could be good if red control becomes a thing, not ramp control. Um, just, uh, food for that thought. That just needs so much, that just needs so much that just isn't there right now. Like, most of red's sort of controlling effects are on, I mean, unless you could manage, like, a proactive creature removal package, right? Mm -hmm. Playing, like, chargers or imagine so like i i know you guys probably don't i know broski doesn't play hearthstone i don't know about you flo but like there's a rush mechanic in uh in hearthstone which is charge except it can only swing at creatures but they tend to be printed on well statted creatures as opposed to a lot of charges mm -hmm. uh in this game and in hearthstone tend to be slightly understated so imagine something like battle rage orc but with good stats but they can only charge against creatures like if that sort of archetype a creature based removal became a thing like the with the like with consider like how viper is sort of creature based single target removal in green yeah maybe red could be a thing but red just would need so much more love than it already has in terms of like removal and then like card cycle and draw like there's just a lot that's missing from that in my opinion yeah the only thing i can think of similar is i know red has hunter killers that's seven drop that battles two things which mm -hmm. sort of does a similar thing but the stats are just awful and yeah, similar for four. That's like a three four with charge, which I mean, those stats really aren't great either. So yeah, if something like that pops up, if red control pops up, um, I mean maybe, but it'd still be a seriously techie choice because there are a very select amount of times you want to play a five five for seven. Mm -hmm. Now, what if there was um, what if there was something? And now I'm just theory. Now I'm just making up random shit. So it's pretty much irrelevant. <laughs> Okay, mm -hmm. but what if there was a way, so it's similar to how, like, purple can ramp and green can get temporary magic with, like, contracts and bring off and, sh and stuff, but, like, what if in red it, there was a way to effectively set your your max magicka uh, at a higher level prematurely, but then it wouldn't advance? Like, this is just way out here, but, like, a, say, like, a three magicka card that'd be, like, set your max magicka to nine, but then, like, that card would be banned, and that would never well, happen. I, I mean, I, the detail would work out, but you see what I'm saying? So, like, it would, it would progress so, all the way to 12, you know? So right, on right. turn three, on turn three, you play a support, and your next turn you have nine mana? Something like that, yeah. Oh, man. Oh, I mean, not necessarily nine, and not necessarily at turn three, but no, you I get the idea. Know. I think we need to ban the dead bro nerd like ultimate, card. That ain't happening, dude. Ultimate, <laughs> ramp, but something that could be like a match? Okay. So let's say it was turn four, but then you'd mm -hmm. set your magic to nine. Turn four, you wouldn't play anything. I mean, okay. that's a pretty yeah. big loss in tempo when you consider it. Plus, if you were to then have nine magic the next turn, you'd have to play cards that would enable you to – you'd have to play one big card that could then be Pierce play, Gallon. Or you play 12-12 like, guard on turn four, though. Yeah, but, I mean, it gets Territorial Vipered or, you know, yeah. Silence or Cast in the Time. So all I'm saying is that, like, an artificial ramp but that caps itself, so it doesn't go past twelve. I don't know. Now I'm just now I'm just being banned. Hire me, design team. I will get. I will ruin your game. Now, if it were like, if it were, okay, so if it were support for three that said like you have nine mana. 
for the next turn or the next mm. two turns and then it reverts but you have to like take a turn off to do that mm-hmm. that would be interesting something like that yeah. well yeah. just a way that's, to that's like artificially advance red's ability to play things be above curve because like that's kind of the problem with control right now it's either really reactive um or proactive requires more resources you know yeah so yeah so I stop beating this uh this humor. this car down to the ground and uh <laughs> move on <laughs> that's why i'm here to move to move things on right icy shambles when i get, when I get too off topic yeah. right <laughs> Icy Shambles, four drop. Oh boy. Two, three. It's a skeleton. I didn't know that. Wow. Okay. Uh, two, oh, I didn't get that. You get Dawnbreaker. Oh, okay. Um, Icy Shambles, oh, four drop, two, three, summon, deals two damage to a creature, and then it shackles creature damage by Icy Shambles. Mm-hmm. So, this is probably the most interesting card, in my opinion, of this set. Um, what card dies with this? What, what what card is that nerd? Dawnbreaker. Not Dawnbreaker. The Dawnbreaker doesn't what? die. Dawnbreaker, Dawnbreaker just kills it. I thought that's what you meant. Yeah, no, no. What 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 card? No. You mentioned Dawnbreaker. No, I what? was thinking of Skeletal Champion when I heard it was a skeleton. I'm yeah. gonna put this in my skeleton trap. No, I'm <laughs> saying skeleton. what I'm saying is so there's another now. there is another four card. What? That, that does you, what? That you drop and it does two damage and it's four drop. Oh yeah, oh, Black Hand Messenger. Ash oh Ash Servant with the yeah, four. Ash yeah, Servant. Yeah, I yeah, think that card's dead. Because it's it strictly is. worse. <laughs> <laughs> In every way, that, shape, I mean, or form. That card died when it was printed. So. Yeah. I mean, it had faith. Like, there was hope. You know? Like, I don't know. <laughs> it's just... if Okay, if, if, if Ash Servant had was a 2-3 or a 3-3, three, three, it would probably be considered really good. Yeah. But I mean, at 2-2, two, two, it can be executed. It can be firebolted as a 4-drop. And that just sucks. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so bad. All right. Well, my thoughts so on this Ash. One can't be I see shambles. Um, yeah, okay. I could turn them up or turn myself down, or both. Mm. Anyways, I see shambles. I think that it's the most interesting and it's probably the best in the set because of its cost. Number one and number two, it um, it has a. Uh, it has shackle, and shackle is it, it's already in. And I said this to nerd whenever he was asking everybody's opinions for his article and i said that shackle is really powerful and it needs oh, i'm sorry i'm losing my try it's already a part of the most some of the most powerful cards that are in the game for example shrieking harpy and we also have um uh, the green one drop one three guard that has shackle as well so it's it's already it's already part of it plus it adds to the curve uh, on, of it being a four, so I think I think in of itself it's it's a good card. I don't know what are y'all thoughts. Yeah, I think it's a super good card to stall the game. Which anything that wants to control, especially in purple, and I'm sure we'll be seeing necromancers bring this back in the future. Um, it's a serious speed bump. So you play it on four, something's immediately shackled. Generally on four, you have like one thing that you actually want to hit face with. Um, so that gets shackled, and then the next turn you're shackling something else, and then on six you bring back the next necromancer and shackle something different. Also, this pairs with uprising, so if you uprise with the necromancer, yada yada yada. Um, interesting that they printed it this way. I feel, you know, I'm kind of conflicted, right? So, on the power struggle between control and aggro, I think aggro has the edge right now. So it doesn't really surprise me that they printed a really efficient um, stall tool. This one though, I'm almost kind of worried about. It's just it because of those the importance of those turns, right? Those turns four through eight for any deck that's trying to be proactive and finish the game. This card can stop your entire assault for three turns by itself and then be brought back. So I'll need to play with it more. I haven't um, I didn't craft the madness back of this card, so I haven't actually like toyed around with this card. Um, but I think it could be really, really, really strong. I'm interested to see if you guys have played with it, how it sort of functions and what you think. Um, I did get to play with it. I was playing, um, Alter Scout with, uh, Madness Beckons in it. So it's very controlly, similar to, you know, like a Telvani shell, but not as good because Telvani bores me. Um, but, um, yeah, so I got to pull this one and then I Galen'd it, which was really fun. 
Um, so I was pulling beefed up guys uh, later yeah. on. And so they started trading and shackling the things they traded with. Because that's the thing people forget about this. You play it, you can either kill, like, kill something with the two damage that it does, or you can shackle something that's bigger, and of course it does the damage to it. Which, by the way, triggers Leaf Lurkers. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So there's one more way to trigger that. Maybe finish-offs come back? I did see a couple finish-offs in somebody's warp meta deck um, this a, weekend. A, a so of, uh, bring back finish-offs. I, I liked that in like old school base set. You'd play that and Leaf Lurkers. That was fun. I mean, uh, but anyways, uh, I think like what people forget about the card is that it, it sets up, uh, it shackles things that it wants to trade with like Deepwood Trapper, which is actually really valuable considering you can hide this in the shadow lane, right? As opposed to Deepwood being a guard, mm -hmm. this one's not a guard. So you can slap it in shadow if your opponent's, you know, dumping a bunch of things over there get the initial shackle or damage off and then on the next turn trade uh and shackle another thing that's really really big I so i might be making an assassin deck when this uh comes out <laughs> uh i i'm actually right with flo i'm a little concerned about this card to be honest um okay. the other thing is what i'm unsure about is whether this will start seeing play in things like battle mage and dagoth right which run shrieking harpies but they run harpies now okay like you have the lethal dig off that runs like pets and stuff but like does this is is there too much reactive stuff and things like the like a mid bm and then like dig off will they will this see play in there like harpies see play because they're freaking busted right off prophecy you know, yeah i was um i was thinking about that in dig off and it's interesting because uh some of like a mid like a late mid or controlled dig off some of the downfall there is it's hard to find what you need at the right time. Like those mm -hmm. colors can put everything in there. It's just hard to get what you need when you need it. And this card sort of functions really well in that shell because it just slows the game down. Mm -hmm. You can stall and stall and stall. So you have a gambit and nothing lethal. You can mm -hmm. shackle or kill something with this and then gambit it and shackle something else or mm -hmm. crossbows, same thing, lethal and everything. Um, so I think it actually could really fit really well in Dagoth. So you think it sort of goes into like adds redundancy to like a reactive Dagoth? build yeah i think it could fit there for sure yeah, it's just one of those things it's it's tough to evaluate because it's not really a direct comparison to the blue harpy because harpy's prophecy yeah. and that's why everyone plays it and if in blue decks that don't have access to like pet then it's like it's so like mid bm is specifically what i'm interested in like is that it's a kind of a small body for four drops so it can't really it can't really like switch and start going on the attack very well you know yeah, I'm not sure it'll – I don't think BM needs it too, too badly. Maybe. Yeah. I could maybe see, like, one or mm -hmm. two. Uh, I don't think it fits that deck as nearly as well as it fits Dagoth or um, something like uh, Talvani with Necromancers. Huh. Yeah, but, that's, you know, a, that's a pretty much a given. <laughs> well, yeah. if they ever it's decide to nerf it, they'll, uh, they'll just make it cost five. That would be such a bad look for them, printing something and then immediately nerfing it. Like I like I mean, you know what I mean? Five though. I mean. Nah, but well, at five, I'd argue it's not very playable. I don't think it's playable it's five. Good. Honestly, when I first you looked at it, and of course I don't agree zero. with this thought, but my first, my first, first, first initial thought, which is wrong, was mm. ha, why is it why is it not a three? Um, because that would really work well in the curve. You know, you drop deep with oh, yeah. trapper and then shrieking harpy and then this. But I'm just like, for maximum yeah. shackle potential. <laughs> <laughs> but that seems shackle assassins back, baby. <laughs> <laughs> they can't win if they can't hit you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I, I'm just a little concerned about this, but I, I think they need to be really careful. This is the first major influx of cards that the game has seen in a while. Like, mm -hmm. if they mess this up or like. You know, if something go goes crazy, and inevitably something will come to the top as really, really strong, and everybody's going to ask for it to be, you know, nerfed and whatever. But I just think it would be really not a good look if they print something and then immediately nerf it. That just shows that they, they don't, as the new developer, they, they don't necessarily know what they're doing. So I'm just kind of – I don't think this card is that. But just on the on the note of, well, okay, they'll just nerf it, I'm like, just get, it seems nah, concerning. Yeah. I don't think it's busted. Not – I mean – not in my opinion, at least. I think it's annoying. I think it's going to be really <laughs> annoying. I'm trying to end the game pretty quickly. Um, 
-hmm. Yeah, I think it would need to see more play and probably other cards to interact with it before it would see a nerf. Yeah. All right. Let's go on and move on to the next card. Probably, even though I think Icy Shambles is the best, Crazed Hunger is my favorite um, because I'm an aggro player. Uh, Crazed Hunger 2 drop, 0 2. However, um, it, this card ability reads charge. Crazed Hunger gets plus 2 plus 0 on your turn. Um, awesome, in my opinion. Uh, 2 drop, uh, you know, a charge ability on a 2. I. Other than like North Firebrands, which already instantaneously dropped down for zero with one one, this is something a little bit different in the sense that now it's a, you know it does two damage you know on round two and it gets you know the charge ability, uh, but you can even buff it up more you know with something like Halalu, uh, where you would have Divine mm -hmm. Fervors or uh, Scimitars or whatever you have. So I I, I see it being effective. Uh, I like it. I like it just looking at it and. Honestly, it's still, in my opinion, a decent drop on round two, even if you can't buff it up because, you know, you can go in for a trade um, on round two with some things. But uh, the, the downside of it is if you don't, you know, get a trade, possibly, you know, if you're playing against, like, maybe a controlly type of deck, you drop it down and you have no choice but to maybe hit face just because you want something on the in the lane. Um, it doesn't really work defensively because it doesn't have any damage and if itself it doesn't have any attack um, whenever it's in your opponent's turn so what are y'all's thoughts i'm gonna go ahead nerd and i'll follow up uh sure uh honestly <clears throat> my thing about this card uh it one i think it'll be pretty it adds another really good tool for halalu who right now with skulk being bumped to three would like another green two drop to then have halalu oathman come down um, so that's kind of nice. Plus, it, it gets an, it could get buffed as a charger off of any it's number of things, haunted manor, divine forever, etc. In fact, maybe this card and starts incentivizing uh, haunted manors being played instead of forevers in the future. That might be a long shot. I don't know, but I still think haunted manor has a has a role. Like I think it's still relevant. It's just you need to build your deck around that as opposed to before it was just. A given, you know. Oh man, this card, this card's just nuts. Now it's like, okay, I need to sort of have some smaller drops. I need a lot of token generation. Put the raiding parties in, etc. Um, but the best thing that I saw when I was putting the article together, and I just want to read it off. Uh, this is a quote from um, Logic. Uh, I hope I, I believe he's hanging out in chat. Yes. Um, so this is. I'm just going to directly quote Logic here because I think this is my favorite interpretation of the card. Crazed Hunger is an interesting card. I can't decide if it's supposed to be cheap removal, reach, or just another two drop, but its real strength might be its ability to perform any of these roles. It rewards the player for taking control of the field lane so your opponent can't get a free trade, and as with any charge creature, it can become very powerful with the right buffs. I think that's the most balanced impression of it that I've seen. A lot of people are either, this is great, or a lot of people are like, it's garbage, it's a firebolt that's, that's a two-mana firebolt. And I think that you know, logic's right on the number, it can be any of those things. Um, and I think flexibility is just should be valued highly in a card. It may not be amazing, but I think it's, I think it will see play at least in some fashion. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to put it. Um, we were talking about elegant card design earlier, and I think this is a really, really good example. Like, I think it's awesome to have a two cost, two, two with charge, but it's not, like it has a debuff, that little, it doesn't have any power on your turn or on your opponent's turn, rather. Um, I was talking about Token Monk earlier as well, and I think this card goes right into Token Monk. Um, I think, obviously, with things like Fifth Legion Trainer, Divine Fervor, you get more attack. Um, but also, Token Monk likes to play things like Cleric of Crime, Cloud Rest, things that keep this card alive, things that make it stronger. Like, a 2-4 with charge, with like a Cleric is much, much better than the 2-2 two -two with charge. So, it interests me. I don't think it's going to go directly in every deck. I don't think it's quite that powerful, but I think it's a really, really cool design. And, and I mean, I could be wrong. A 2-2 with charge, you know, could be powerful. I know Red has a couple charging creatures. They have a 3-1 a for 2 that has charge if there's a wounded creature in a lane that no one ever plays. <laughs> um, I think the 2-2 is a better stat line, but I'm up in the air. And I think Logic was uh, hit the nail on the head when he said that its value is in its flexibility. Um, I think it's a lot more viable in aggressive strategies and control strategies just because, like, 
if it's in a control strategy, right, it would be used to damage something because it's probably not going to kill something. And then it would be needed to be uh, used with like leaf or a finish off, which I mean, you can rapid shot or use other things for that. So mm -hmm. I'm interested to see where it'll be played. And I wouldn't uh, be too surprised if we saw it in things like Hualu or Aggressive Monk or Aggressive anything with green, honestly, Archer. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and it can receive buffs from um, like something like an Orc Clean Captain or like a fifth, a fifth Legion Trade especially would be great. And then it will at least have at least one damage on the uh, the return trade. Yeah, I, I think it's a, I think you're right. And this is another thing that fits into the idea of having, you know, you mentioned that you didn't think it would be in every deck. And I think that's awesome, right? Sorry. Auto includes typically aren't good for the game. Like ideally every card is a niche scenario and that we can't, that that's not a reasonable expectation, of course. Um, but it's something that I think does the like, designers should aspire to. And I think this fits that really, that mold really well. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, Broski? Yeah. Um, uh, I've already said my sense on, uh, Chris hunger when we first started off with that. Um, nothing really to add on extra. We are, we are just, just to let you guys know, we're about an hour and five minutes into this. So, uh, if you guys don't mind, we can get through the next couple of cards a little bit more hastily. Um, I can't promise that I won't rant. Can't promise. <laughs> <laughs> we'll rant, we a lot of thoughts. rant shortly. <laughs> um, I, I, okay. So next card, this is, in my opinion, the one with the, a lot, all of these cards have pretty elegant design but i think this one has the most elegant design simply because we haven't don't have a card that has this um i think it's expensive and we'll get there eight drop it's it's a dark seducer it's a daedra seven seven it has drain and guard with the card's description as dark sorcerer drains on both turns um there's not much to say about this card unless you guys feel like there is i think it just it's expensive and i don't really see where we get a lot of play however because it's expensive however i do like that it has drain on both turns um but the reason why i don't think it's going to see a lot of play uh, is because of lethals at an eight drop vipers because of silences because they're definitely a thing in this meta so i think that while it is interesting i don't see how it's going to get a lot of play what are y'all's thoughts yeah i agree i just think it doesn't have a home um like if you're playing a control deck it's just a big guard like it has drain that's awesome but unless you're like running ring and amira or something to make use of that life gain it's not really gonna help you out all that much besides not letting you die um if you're playing against aggro and you're using it it's basically a big guard that says if you can't answer this i win which those already exist and they're not you know super great because anyone who's playing aggro is going to keep a silence for their last two or three cards um It'll need other cards, I think, is my take on it. It can't stand alone and be great by itself. Its effect is super, super powerful. Don't get me wrong. Like like I said, if you're playing against an aggressive opponent and they can't answer it, they can't win. I mean, there's just no chance. Um, but there are too many answers. Shadow shifts, silences, things that steal guard, like agents. Um, that's my two cents. What do you think, Erd? Um, let's, yeah, you're right. It doesn't have a home. I... I would love to see like a, a reason to play this in like a controlly or like high end mid range sorcerer deck or something like that. I mean mid sork, let's be real. No matter what Brisky says, mid sork is aggro. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, although mine runs Nogleave at the top end, which by the way, like compare this card to Nogleave, I'm running Nogleave every time, and like it's hard to have. It's hard to fit this in when you've got better, you know, sorcerer options like Nogleave, like hell, even Skeletal Dragon is arguably better because it, when it dies, it can get you a card back with a buff on it. You know, like recursion is really strong and, and like continuing to fuel your resources. It's so like with plenty of other ways to heal in, uh, well, maybe not plenty, but other ways to heal in purple. Is the heal necessary? It's definitely the best heal we've seen in a while. Um, but this on a lower costed card, even like a seven uh, or definitely a six coster, would have been amazing. We'd be thinking about this entirely differently. But getting to turn eight against aggro, which this card is best against aggro, 
it's tough, and I I'm, don't see a reason to play this over something like Naha Gleave, or even it, it, even in a deck where like <laughs> even in a deck where I could afford to play Skeletal Dragon, <laughs> like <laughs> like I'd take Skeletal Dragon personally. Uh, I just um, but I'd like to see that. I'd like to see me want to play this card. Um, and I think that's just a testament to, like, there's ramping's less efficient now. It's also riskier now with aggro being so good. And, like, what was the uh, Hist Histgrove out of green? Is that green? No, that's purple. Excuse me. Purple, out of purple, yeah, like, Histgrove. <laughs> How dare I? Uh, oh, no. Histgrove. Um, with the nerf, whenever that was. Um, I don't know. There's just... Look. I want it to be good. It's such a cool effect. I think it's just... It's just not sad. The hist will provide. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. I'd, I'd like to see it be better. I'm tripping over here. I was thinking of the guard card with the hist, and uh, it's actually... Mm. It's hist card. mage is... A, yeah. yeah, hist mage is scout. I mean, maybe Scout, die. maybe Scout can play this. Uh, um, the other thing is, it does. It is a Daedra, so it's a, actually a decent pull off of like Barbus. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, Daedra always have the coolest effects. Yeah, they do. Daedra, there's a lot of, but then there's the couple Daedra that are just hot garbage. Yeah, and that's you're just true. like, ugh. Like, Barbus isn't it's like the the five eight drag? Or no, that's a drag, obviously. There's one I can't remember. Lumbering Augum's a Daedra. Seven four. They can't get cover. Yeah. There's also like the um, the like maybe it's like a six three or six two. Uh, that's a red. Um, oh yeah, dreaded clan fear. Oh, and that's like guard. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. Um, but that's not one that I think you're sitting there hoping for in a lot of matchups. I think when not you play that, sower. yeah, you want sower. You want. Uh, Actually, one of the interesting ones that I found uh, is that uh, that eight drop in yellow with guard that reduces things attack for the turn. I pulled that That's several times. Yeah, I think so. Doesn't and it I, have Imperial in the main? No, I don't think so. Nasty, now I'm, now you make me doubt myself, man. Um, oh, don't take my word for it. I'm wrong. <laughs> But no, I, that's the one. Uh, I'm pretty sure because I think the flavor text is something about eating somebody. So <laughs> that seems dangerous ish to me. Um, yeah. But that one, I, like, off, pulling that off of Barbus doesn't feel bad. And so I, I would imagine pulling this off of Barbus in like a later game scenario doesn't feel bad either. I mean, it's still like yeah, sure. decent stats, you know, it can attack, like, it, it heals. Yeah. So I imagine that still doesn't feel terrible. It's tough. I wish I had more to say about this, to be honest. Well, we've got two more cards yeah. left on the list. I think this. Oh one... yeah, Shrine Guardian. It is. It's Daedra. Yeah. Shrine Guardian. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Shrine Guardian. Yeah. That that's like another card that like, uh, you know, doesn't really have a home, but is such an interesting effect. You know, it's honestly a pretty good comparison to this card because they have sort of similar mechanics. If you can't answer this, you lose. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think Shrine Guardian is a pretty decent card, though. Yeah, I do too. And I think Shrine Guardian also is um, has arguments for like anti control things. Like Necromancers don't work with Shrine Guardian. Vipers don't work with Shrine Guardian. Like mm -hmm. if someone tries to pull a Nixox combo, it, that mm -hmm. doesn't work either. Um, yeah, just, I think Shrine Guardian might be a little more flexible, but it's just like a in yellow with no ramp, you know, and it's yeah, expensive. That's if this card was like again, we're looking at a card that if it was like a six or seven, might be played right now. Um, yeah. And like, I think that's something that with 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 experimental effects like this one, I think like like Dark Seducer is an experimental effect, as in like the devs have never seen how this will play out. I think that people tend to overstat these sorts of things just because they don't want it to just wreck everything. Because it's, mm -hmm. but that's like we'll, we often see things like that. Like, this isn't a great comparison because Ash Servant was never good. But like Ash Servant was one of the first cards that had like a like a proactive body and that also dealt damage to something, right? But that card was overstated, right? If that was a three drop that did that, it'd be good. Um, 
And so, like, we see further iterations down the road. We see things like Black Hand Messenger, which d deals to damage but also has a drain and a last gasp. Now we're seeing Icy Shambles. And so, like, that was sort of laying the groundwork um, for them to find that perfect fit of when dealing to damage attached to a creature is viable. And so I think we're looking at a similar thing with Shrine Guardian and with, uh, with Dark Seducer, that maybe these two things are, like, the devs are okay with it not being great but then they can see how it actually plays out and learn yeah. from it and, and dial them down and find more ways to use the mechanic if not attached to that high cost body. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the, uh, the next card, the meme card. Um, I think this is the memeiest ah. of them all. Um, yeah. I think honestly, I think they made this for memes, and there's nothing wrong with. I, I mean, I don't see how you would make this card and be like, "This is something that's going to change the meta." I just don't. I don't. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, and I, I think that's know. okay. And so this is for people who just want to have a little bit of fun. I think uh, people like Justin Larson will probably make about three videos with this, and people will just have a good old time watching it. Giant chicken, in of itself, it sounds like a meme. It is a tri chicken tribunal. Uh, no, chicken tri chicken tribal. Ugh. Chicken Tyson. I don't know, dude. Seven drop. <laughs> giant chicken. Um, it's a beast card. Five, five. Right? So it's already expensive as all get out. And when it dies, its last grasp ability fills the lane with one, one confused villagers. Um, I don't know. If I wanted to make this a little bit memeier, if it would confuse villagers, it's like, uh, it'd be pretty interesting if, uh, like the, the, the description for confused villagers would be like, uh, doesn't know what to do so they're like you know they might attack you they might attack your opponent they might get a buff or two one they might <laughs> they might get lethal they don't know because they're confused if you made the confused villagers more interesting than a one one yeah that'd be fun um <laughs> just for fun i mean the card's already a meme like you would never ladder this i mean try i mean you would but for memes i mean but yeah. you wouldn't ladder it to go i might be wrong who knows maybe somebody like good like warrior yeah. might just swoop on any he's like this is actually the best card and you know, beats like the next seven warp metas with this. But as of where I stand right now, I think that Confused Villagers would... I think we need a little bit more meme out of this. You know, for a seven it, drop. Interesting. Interestingly, Turquoise Link on Twitter said that he thought this card was actually decent. What? Um, I, I'm, you know, I think, <laughs> I think it may have just been a... Everybody's dumping on the card. And so maybe just sort of giving it a little bit of... Uh, Given a little bit of love. Uh, I don't think I agree, except I think this, I can see myself drafting this in Arena, to be honest. Like, yeah. um, there's not as much silence in Arena, so you drop a 5-5 five, five, or 7. Most of the stuff is going to be subpar anyways, and most Arena decks want a couple cards on the higher end. Um, and in Arena, where it's likely to see its fullest effect, of that, it's basically 9-9 nine, nine stats for 7, so... I, yeah, and and this would not be another great card that like yeah it's slightly understated, but then it dies. A bunch of one ones come in, and then you drop some of the items because items are really good in arena. Um, Crusader chicken, that's what we need. Yeah, well hey, I mean you can <laughs> draft a divine forever, draft a I don't know what's that uh, the green card that uh, the, the the field makes the field lane a shadow lane too that buffs everything's attack by one. That could be good. Hidden you trail. see what I mean? Yeah, Hinchel. I should know that. I played that card. Why do I not know that? Fun card. I played it in Movement Monk before Goblin Skulk made that much worse. Yeah, it's what a good, your, really good card. What are your game. thoughts, Mega? Uh, I think it, I think it's Mimi. Like you guys said <laughs> it. Uh, I I don't think it's good. I could see how Turquoise Link could say it's decent. I mean, it has uses. It's way it's way better than the Prize Chicken the zero one. Uh, <laughs> not a hard I mean, like, bar to surpass. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it was no contest actually. Uh, but I mean, it can activate catapults. It can fill a lane. You do something like, uh, I don't know, kill the chicken into war cry. Uh, mm. I think it's the worst of the set and it might've been included in the six, uh, for the devs to be able to say, like, if anyone were to say madness beckons is like an actually viable playable card, they could say, I mean, you, you can get the chicken. So, yeah. um, I think it's funny. I think it's a fun card to play with. Not the best choice of these six cards, but I think that's probably for a reason. Yeah. Well, and, and randomly generating it off of an Elder Gleam also oh, wouldn't yeah. be terrible, right? Yeah. It's like situations where you don't actually run your deck, but you run across it vis-a-vis -vis random generation or drafting an arena. 
it's not unplayable like prize chicken. Right. You know? <laughs> Which, thank God, right? about prize chickens, boy. I'll kill y'all. <laughs> <laughs> So, we need I mean, some chicken buffs. You like, committed crimes you against it. Skyrim and our people. <laughs> you need a three drop, zero, zero, gains plus one, plus one for each chicken and villager that died this turn. Ooh, or this game. yeah. So Dude, unique. chicken and villager synergies. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Move aside, wolf synergies. <laughs> chicken synergies. Chicken synergies. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Oh, gosh. All right. Last card. Not part of this. Not part of the set. This is the monthly card that was already leaked, but now that it's official, we can officially, officially talk about it. Even though we've already talked about it, but now we can officially talk about it because it's official. All right. Mm. Ashlan Punisher, four drop, dark elf plays an archer. It's a red green. It is a five four with its card description having breakthrough, piffler and slay plus one plus zero. Piffler. Piffler. <laughs> Pilfer. <laughs> Pilfer! <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> Gosh, dude, that's a habit that is. I'll never break the habit. It's super cute. <laughs> it's so <laughs> adorbs. <laughs> All right. Well, um, the cool part is you uh, it has breakthrough, therefore it gains. I see people. I don't see people compare this to another card, and I don't know the other card, but. Honestly, Ashland Punisher, unfortunately, it's in the curve where it gets killed by uh, Lightning Bolt. But other than that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't write it off. I mean, it's a good trade for um, Siege Catapult, and when it's not trading like its own life away, it's a decent trade against something that might be cheaper. Plus, it gets if you look at it, it's Piffler and Slay. So if it has Breakthrough, let's say it's going against something like a one one, like a Nord Firebrand. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the chances of that happening, but if that happens, he does it, and now it's a uh, uh, now it's a seven three because it it does a breakthrough. It does damage to the face, and then on top of that, it gets the uh, the slay effect. So it does the uh, the piffler and the slay at the same time. So I think it's I think it's nice. I don't know the other card that people like compared it to that said, hey, this card isn't as good as this one. And it's not worth it on the curve, but I've seen other people like use it with uh, Archer's Gambit. That's what people are experimenting it with, and so mm -hmm. using that to help with its uh, slay effect, which is you know of course Archer's Gambit. The issue with that is it's a one does one damage, so you know the chances of actually actively making that work unless you combo it up with something else. But um, it's nice. Like I don't think it's a game changer, and this is something else that I would say once again. It's interesting card design. And I don't think uh, what a lot of people see for in, in, in new cards anytime they want new cards to be instantaneously. It's instantly we can just drop it and do a new deck. But I don't think that's good card design. In my opinion, I think good card design is going, you know, allowing people to make their own decks and make cards that are, you know, good, great. As opposed to just making great cards all the time. And I think this falls right into that category where... It's, it's not instantaneous, like, am I always going to put this in Archer? No. Am I always going to put this in a Lalo deck? No. But it's worth considering, depending on how I want to build my deck. What are y'all's thoughts? Yeah, I agree with most of that. I think, um, as a monthly, like, the really impactful monthlies either go into a deck that's already good, or they're so good that they create an archetype on their own. Like, so are made Agro Warrior <laughs> whenever it's printed. Um, mm. But... This card, I'm not really sure does either of those. Like you were saying, it's bad in Lalu. Decent in Dagoth, throw us a uh, six house amulet on it, and it gets a ward. You can put a ward crafter on it to make sure it doesn't take damage. Um, the problem, though, is it, you have to really be careful if you're playing a four drop that doesn't impact the board, because if you just lose all your value when it gets removed, oftentimes you've lost the game. Um, that said, I think the one place they could really shine is like, a strike archer like you were talking about with archer's gambit and the sword of the inferno and like torval executionist there's things with massive power this thing uses archer's gambit gets to six or seven and then you use something like swift strike to finish someone off uh it could be used in decks like that um i just think right now that archetype is too much of a glass cannon but who knows maybe some really great players will play around with this card and find a build that survives long enough to finish someone off with a swift strike fairly consistently and the card could be a star. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts, uh, nerd? So, 
One of the things that interests me is uh, what are the other options at that drop? Um, so green has in, in any sort of the only reason you'd play this, you would play this in some sort of you know proactive deck, right? You, you play it onto the board because you want to establish a big threat, right? Um, similar to how I mean, and also for the record, curving this into an extortionist ain't bad. Um, yeah. And both that, that's I mean back to back threats that they need to remove, or you get to do all your shenanigans with gambits and swords and whatever, right? Um, and so giving and just like when I said when extortionist came out, extortionist puts a big it, it, it's a big target for the opponent to blow their removal on before you play a child of piercing, right? In similar mm -hmm. fashion. This card comes down, and they are scared of it, so they use their lightning bolt on it. Well, that's removal that they then can't use on Extortionist, which is then removal they can't use on a Child of Hearsay, right? So this is just sort of the ideal curb situation. Now, that's not always going to happen. We know this. But um, the other thing is, let's look at some of the other four drops that they have. I went ahead and pulled it up. So four drops, now, I think in the past, this card would never see play, because Ash Berserker was just that good, right? But now, Ash Berserker is not just that good. It's very niche, if if at best, right? And so we're looking at, what, Candle Hearth Brawler, which is situational. Douche Nukial Archer, which admittedly is a freaking awesome card. Same with Earthbone Spinner. So, but those cards are both pretty reactive, right? Yeah, they're all reactive. Right. They all so have the only, board impact. Yeah, and, and so the only other four drop that seems super valuable in red to me is Garnag. Um, and that is a situation where in a late game deck, if you're running Rage, you don't run Garnag, right? Um, and so the greens are even even worse. I think green has some of the worst four drops in the game. Um, with what Viper is among the best, you've got and that's reactive. Moonlight Werebat. You know, uh, am I missing something here? You said Moonlight <laughs> Werebat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, Nightfire used to be great. Uh, uh, but the point is, I think that there's maybe a lack at that spot, which is why it's a four drop in Archer, because those two colors don't have great options for a proactive build. Um, so even if that card doesn't become a superstar, we may just see it as a decently statted. I mean, it is 5 4 for four. That's above average and aggressive stats. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, the other thing that I, I, I've been saying is that what it does for a Rage Archer is it gives you a one turn combo for 12 magicka that mm -hmm. you can play the the ashlander punisher and then rage um in one turn because it adds up to 12 basic maths um that has on, and you can rage a creature with breakthrough against a conscription link for seven to ten damage to the face so wow yeah that's a good point so so you drop this in a lane and say everything has less than uh either five health or less mm. so by the fourth, say they all have less than five health, right? So this gets the breakthrough sure. and the slay on each one. So on the last creature, then, it would be five, you six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You're dealing eleven damage to that last creature. Say it's got mm -hmm. three HP. Wow, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. I can see that. I, you know, like a, a mid-range archer deck, or a mid-range uh, rage deck, which mm -hmm. was popular. You were talking about Child of Hercene. That was around in a mid-range rage I deck. I would be playing with archer after this stream. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, well, and it's just because there's no other option that would allow you to play the two together, except for, I guess, Garnag. Does Gar when does Garnag's effect come in? At the start of the turn? Uh, it's Garnag, Garnag is so, as soon as you summon. Yeah. So as soon as you summon, so then you wouldn't even matter. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, as soon as you summon, both both people only have seven magic, yeah, uh, so and then when it's your opponent's turn, um, he can get rid of Garnag, but no matter right. even if he gets rid of it he only has seven magicka so it, mm -hmm. it could like, i'll, I'll right. Garnag. Garnag is, Garnag Garnag the, the point the point is like there's no other great 12 mm. magicka rage like creature than rage except mm. for things with lethal which doesn't drive damage so right that was the and so like you can now do that against a conscription deck like conscription telvani if that still exists i haven't seen it as much but it's, I know it's still there, but, you know, and drive that extra bit of damage, um, as well as clearing the lane. I mean, um, honestly, yeah. like, it's just, you know, food for thought. You could probably do, like, a, uh, um, I don't know, I'm going to experiment. This seems kind of meme -y, but, I mean, it might work out where 
you do you do a draw deck like a deck that focuses on drawing you know marketing mm. and uh you do that and uh you know you do uh what is it the uh, shadow marking you do gambler mm. and you know you run those kind of cards and pretty much allow your opponent to fill up a lane and then by the time you get to the end game he thinks he's about to win you drop this un you know the unstoppable force and then you win like you're just you're just done so i mean he thinks he's got it yeah. and then you're like hey you know like <laughs> so uh yeah it's... It could be neat because, like, the problem, of course, the problem is you need to keep your life to above board to get all the way to the rage turn. But you're right. Um, but and, green, and has, green has green great has cycle. Green. So, I mean, it's possible. Yeah. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you, I mean, you, yeah, good point. Um, so that that's all. Any other final thoughts on, on Ashlander, Flo? Uh, the only final thought that I would have for it is in Dagoth. Um, Dagoth doesn't have a lot of unconditional procs for five power, Ash Berserker, Ash Oppressor, Mighty mm. Conjuring. Um, so like the easily the most easily noted one is uh Vigilant Ancestor, the five four that is always shackled. So that's mm. an instant proc for everything, five power and more. Uh this is as well for four, which is hard to come by. Like I run Stormcloak Vanguards and Dagoth just so sometimes I can play a five five for four. So, I mean, it definitely has value in decks that have five power synergies. Well, that's pretty interesting, too, because there's the uh, there's a couple Ash uh, Servants or Ash somethings that have uh, decent effects that base off of if you have a creature five power more, but they just don't see play because they're, they were harder to self-proc as opposed to Ash Berserker, which is really easy to do. Um, so, like, there's the Ash Piercer, which is the five one that yeah. can deal three damage. Like it would be neat to see those experimented with again and given a second opportunity, um, with the now inclusion of um, Ashlander Punisher on top of, of course, Vigilant Ancestors and things like that. That's a neat thought. One that I think's great. You're talking about the Ash creatures, and I sort of alluded to it. The Ash Oppressor, the three drop in green, so it's a four three for three mm. that shackles something if you have something with five power or more. Which a four three for three is like right on the curve that's, you get to shackle something else that's a huge tempo play if you can proc it turn five or six yeah it's a good thought too and, and especially like um that becomes much less of a bad top deck later in yeah. the game if you can pair it so you go vigilant ancestor than this or you go ashlander than this and then yeah. um ideally like with the increased redundancy of five attack based creatures then top decking it doesn't feel so terrible yeah. yeah, the thing, the reason why Ash Berserker was played over the other ones is because you could activate it on a turn after you played it. wasn't a summon effect, um, and so like you know, and it was easy to proc too. This one seems yeah. if with four or three stats, that's easy to proc too with um, like an Orc Clan Captain or something. But yeah, no, yeah, nice thought. All right. Well, I'm gonna um, we can go ahead and go to the Q and A section at the end of every single stream. We do have a Q and A, so if anybody feels free and ask me any questions. Uh, Deadbart Nerd or Full Omega, feel free to ask any questions. It doesn't just have to be about today's topic. Um, it could just be about anything, anything, you know, in general with Legends. Uh, so feel free to ask those questions. We'll do that for about 10 minutes. I also want to go on ahead and give a huge thanks to uh, Flow Omega for joining today's uh, yeah. uh, show. I do have a link Thank right here. We got him from Podcast Into Time. Podcast Into Time is another Legends podcast. They don't live stream it. Um, but they do podcast it, which is really awesome. And the uh, Dead Broke Nerd and I have not gotten ours on podcasting yet. It's coming eventually. But uh, soon, TM. <laughs> um, <laughs> soon. Uh, but uh, they they already have podcasting. It's great. You guys should totally check them out. Dead Broke Nerd will be visiting one of their episodes too. This is Super our nice excited. little way to do a little cross promotional. And even more so, wink, wink, we're not going to spoil it quite yet. But those who are tuning in right now get to have a little taste. Uh, Legends Lounge and Podcast in a Time is planning a meme tournament. Details will be revealed soon, DM. So, feel free. Which could be anytime. Which could be anytime. If we've learned anything from Sparky Pants and Bethesda Soons. <laughs> it's that uh, yeah. it should not be relied upon. Uh, I actually can I ask a question first? Is that allowed? In well, you can ask you me a question or Flo. I'm gonna ask Flo a question. I can ask you a question yeah, anytime. Okay, <laughs> ask Flo a question. Okay, all right. So there's a lot been a lot of discussion about 
tricolors and the future tricolors in terms of balancing and in terms of um, you know how with with new cards uh, get infused is that going to tilt the balance? Of course, just to recap for everybody, you know a tricolor deck will have access to 75 percent or 33 percent more cards um, than a dual color in that same combination, right? So dual colors would get access to, you know, green and blue, and then Tavani would get access to green, blue, and purple, so uh, uh, even more options, increased redundancy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? I have an idea that I want to run past you. Hit me with that. The answer could be roll-locking dual color cards to dual color classes only. So tricolors can't run dual colors. Dual colors, it sort of preserves their identity. So Sorcerer's Negation can only be played in Sorcerer. Uh, Crusader's Assault can only be played in Crusader. Preserving the identity of the dual colors, giving people incentive to play those over the tricolors, uh, and of course reducing um, some really high efficiency cards from tricolor while not actually punishing tricolor for playing three other things. And of course they can play their Tribunal and Tavana specific ones as well. Thoughts? I like that direction. I think it's too strong. Um, really? I, yeah, because I mean, man, I that would way, really, but, you know, it would really tear a lot of black color decks. Like, I think, I think it's an issue that needs to be addressed, right? Because it's it more than anything, it limits design capacity because they mm -hmm. have to watch what they print in certain colors. Because if that, like, a card in one color can go in like nine decks. A card mm -hmm. in dual colors can go in three decks, and if it's super powerful, it can make one of those decks ridiculous. So yeah. it's definitely restricting, but I'm afraid that if you completely take out dual color cards and tricolor decks, it would like murder a lot of tricolor decks. So like if there were a limit, like like three sets of a dual color card or two mm -hmm. sets of a dual color card and a tricolor deck, um, that might be able to help things out. But I think like so I'm trying to think of tricolor decks just in my mind. Talbani so, obviously would lose like forty percent of their deck, right? Sorcerers uh, negations. Well, they would lose negations. They would lose uh, black hand Negation, messengers. Black hands, queen, Baranzaya, um, debates experiments. Like no, debate, I, debates you, is uh, is tricolor, isn't it? So okay, so that one's safe. Okay, so that one would that one's uh, safe. So he would lose right now seven yeah. cards. Some red Brahmin, some scout report. Uh, but the but so. With a new set coming in, wouldn't that offer more options to replenish? I'm just playing devil's advocate here. No, yeah, no, 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 that's fine. I, I do it daily. Um, yeah. But uh, so yeah, like if they if they were to go that route, they would need to print similar cards in those colors. Like I, I just don't know for me if you ever play Talvani without Sorcerer's Negation, or Queen Baron's Eye, or Black Hand Messenger, or like. Mm -hmm. You don't think if you, you would, would play Dagoth without Fire Over, race, or and... you would play Hualu without Anasi. It would just, it would, it would hurt so bad. Well, um, uh, yeah, I see. I, I mean, I get it. It would definitely be an instant nerf until new cards came out, right? Because then they can shore up those losses with cards from any of the other colors. They just wouldn't be able to include the specific special card. And that's the other thing, like from a flavor perspective, preserving the identity of a dual color class. Like, they feel yeah. – dual colors, the only reason you play them now usually is if you're running a combo deck and want to decrease your deck size or running aggro. And we're seeing more and more uh, track colors move towards aggro as well. So it, it feels like and, – and we all know this, I'm, I, you know, if, but it does feel like dual color decks are losing the incentive to play them a lot. Yeah, so here's where I think I am on it. Um, okay. It would it would open to design space if they were to print more cards in tricolor classes. Because mm. if they were to print if they were to print more cards in single color classes, that would just strengthen the dual color decks. Right. So if they were to print more cards in tricolor classes, that would be fine. But then they're sort of unless they print a lot, they're defining mm. the archetypes of the houses. Because you'd have okay. to print like both aggressive and reactive cards in Talvani if you want to keep mid range. So if they from from now on, and and of course, like I think I think what you're, I think what's interesting here is is you're taking the, okay, if they did this, they'd have to do X, and that's really interesting right. to me. So like if they roll lock the dual color cards, obviously it would be a huge nerf. They would have to then print what one or two cards per set, off of that gives Tovani another card, right? 
Yeah, things in tricolor, but I, I don't yeah. I don't know if I like from a design perspective the devs dictating the archetypes of the houses. So like I think well, I like the idea of that already kind the of houses. There, See, I don't think so. I think there are stronger archetypes in the houses, but like I think, I mean, I think you can win just as consistently with mid range Telvani as conscription. Maybe not just consistently. Maybe that's a little strong, but I think mid range is a completely viable deck. I think mm -hmm. aggro Dagoth and control Dagoth are both completely viable decks. Sure. I think, yeah, Hualu has a control variant that Aini built that I don't think would be quite as good without those tricolor cards. I think from a, a deck building perspective, you are able to do much more, including at least some dual color decks or dual color mm -hmm. cards in tricolor decks. Um, I think it's a problem. Like, I think you're right. I think the concern that you're expressing is totally true. Like, dual color cards were printed before tricolor decks specifically because they were more powerful than single color cards. Mm -hmm. So, allowing a deck that has 75 cards access to just inherently more powerful cards and a wider array of cards mm -hmm. to put into their deck is going to be problematic, especially with how many cards they print. So yeah, I think I those rotations too. Oh, I have an opinion now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Get in here. Okay. Um, go, go while it's there. I think, I think pre, I think the way of handling this, and it would require a lot of changes if people wouldn't lie. But pre houses cards need to be patched because I, I don't think the I don't think the answer is res like restricting dual color cards to never be uh, to not be played at all because there are cards that have come out post. You know, post patch like the card that we just discussed today like i don't really see an issue with this card being played in halalu deck um you know this ashlander card but then you're mm -hmm. having a card like for you know example uh the uh sorrow of revenge that that was pre houses of morrowind uh to my knowledge that card is really powerful and having that card added into um having that card added into tricolor like uh that's a uh, that's that's red purple so that would be played in veteran huh yeah that would be played in veteran but red veteran doesn't get a lot of love but just adding that to veteran anyways you know but being that veteran already has card draw you're allowed the ability to fill in a lane and then just kill him off to do the extra five damage that you need possibly mm -hmm. so um it would just require patches that people wouldn't like so like patching sore revenge is something that people wouldn't like because i'd be a well I'd be afraid that you know by doing that you're you're really gonna limit what they've already built the game up to mm -hmm. do at this yeah. point. Yeah, I, I think the idea here is um, one of the things that I think is an unreasonable expectation is expecting the devs to go and go backwards. I think the devs at this point are just like we're just gonna move forward, and I think I think it's gonna be hard for them to justify time doing stuff to old things, restructuring old cards, restructuring old systems. So instead, you know, the the, the best way to solve this problem, if they even are interested in doing that, um, is going to be moving forward, providing either tools um, to counter um, tricolor decks or maybe an art, maybe a keyword um, that favors uh, dual color, even mono color decks. That could be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, something that that, you know, would... Something that would basically incentivize you to run less colors in your deck, right? So something with a diminishing effect based on the number of colors. I, I don't know. It, it just something has to be done moving forward um, to give you a reason to play some of these dual colors and also stop tricolors from snowballing wildly out of control anytime a yeah. set gets released. I can see them almost doing something like Piercing Twilight for dual color cards, like a creature that says summon, discard every okay so like choose a dual color card in your opponent's deck discard all copies from their d discard mm. pile and or a uh, deck i don't know if they'll do something like that um it seems kind of like a really powerful deck like that we were talking about uh getting rid of cards from your opponent isn't always healthy in card games um right. and the other thing i was going to say with dual color i don't feel like they should be I don't want to frame this. I feel like if you would limit them to only classes, dual color classes, they would be kind of pigeonholed. So like, um, what is so Assassin's Ritual, the mm -hmm. dual color blue green, give a creature ward and lethal. No one ever really plays it. Not really a great card, but mm -hmm. like, it has uses in things like Dagoth. You can pair it with like Archer's Gambit or things with pings like crossbows. Like you can use dual color cards in tricolor decks in ways 
that you just cannot use them in the colors that they're intended for, which some of those ways are really abusive, and hopefully right. they can mitigate that. Um, but some are really kind of creative, and I like the deck building aspect of it. So I'm a bit torn. I think they need to do something about it. I just don't know if completely removing dual color cards from all tricolor classes is right. All right. So from that perspective, um, like if it's the problem, if you like the idea that it gives you ways to interact with cards that otherwise wouldn't be allowed, which is always cool and fun. Um, what about limiting um, cards to two buys instead of three buys in, in tricolor, forcing it to access even more cards as opposed to the increased redundancy? That would be interesting. I think that, so like you can only include two dual color cards, like you can't include all three of a set in any tricolor house or even or i mean i was intent i was intending it to be any card so you can run two barrow stalkers two shrieking harpies two whatever oh oh man <laughs> the, oh, so man. you'd have to that you'd have to reach you have to dig deeper for cards that would fill similar roles you'd see a lot yeah. more creative inputs right you'd see a lot more tech choices probably you'd see but none of with none yeah, of which i mean would have i wouldn't i wouldn't mind increasing. just like we discussed Chance. this on one episode that we can always experiment and go back. And that's something that we've talked about in previous because we're playing a digital card game. We're not playing Magic where it's like physical or trying to, like, there even Magic now, like Magic the Gathering Arena, while it is digital, it, it's really trying to also slash promote their actual physical card game because that's where the money yeah. is made for Magic <laughs> the Gathering. So you can't really change it. But the cool part about Legends is it's always digital. So they can say, hey, for this season, this season alone, we're going to mix things up and dual color cards are locked for dual color. And um, that would be a way of mixing things up. And then they can always go back next season. It's just a nice way to mix they up the pot. Put, and... They would need to do that in casual. If they did that in yeah. competitive, there would be a riot. Yeah, um, yeah, be who cares? I mean, let's just have fun. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of no, Yeah, a lot. The, the, all the biggest and voices tell you about it. the game. Yeah. Well, good yeah. for the biggest voices. They're not the developers, so they can get over <laughs> it. No, I mean, but you're, you, have, you have a great point, though. I would love to see that. Mm -hmm. the, that because quite frankly casual is hot garbage casual is useless yeah. right now if casual was a testing ground for mechanical changes to the game that would be brilliant Take honestly CVH after the stream <laughs> i actually might do it that i honestly think like changing like basically a different format casual would be a different format you know what i mean it's just experimental yeah, we're I, like hey this month we're doing this you know and it's fun i'm so like so a couple times if they had like casual and they had another like testing or like casual is where you bring your meme decks and testing is where you bring your decks that you don't want to put on the ladder but you kind of want to see if they're all right something mm -hmm. like that yeah or if they just make the ai casual smarter. just call it casual plus yeah i don't know yeah all right guys well look i got work now i'm already <laughs> late <laughs> oh, no, no. Sorry, um, sorry. i'll talk to i'll talk to you nerd maybe about making the times earlier because we keep on running into this issue or at least maybe I mean, I start my time. stream usually at 10, so I'm up already. <laughs> All right, so we'll uh, we'll try to figure out another time slot because I'm already – work starts now, so I'm late. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we're going to have to end it right here. Go on ahead and check out Flo Mega's uh, podcast, Podcast Into Time. Go on ahead and check him out on uh, Twitch. I don't think I have my bot, but we can still try it out. Flo, Flo is not in the stream. Okay. Well, that Flo Mega – all right, shout out for Omega. There we go. Elder Scroll last streaming, Elder Scroll Legends. So check him out. Check out Deadbird Nerd. This uh, podcast will be uploaded to YouTube later. And of mm -hmm. course, if you guys are watching right now, I want everybody to just go on ahead and ping CVH. Say that Major Broski told you to do it and tell him that we need the new casual mode where we have a testing for development point of view. That includes you, Flo Mega. I want everybody to tap this on me, all right? Gotcha. So just, just ping cvh and by the time he gets a 6-1 he's gonna be like all right now i hate uh, now i hate major broski and i regret uh following him and hosting him the other night all right guys until next time peace out love life thank you guys thank you so much flow mega for coming yeah. over to the show thank you My pleasure.